Hey everyone, it's been seven days since my last video, and I must confess, I'm shocked with the poor quality of journalism in Canada. Hi, I'm Diana Davison. As part of my ongoing investigation into the public shaming and the travesty of justice that was the Gian Gameshi trial, I've been sitting on some information that I think will help the CBC fix one of their biggest problems, methodical, malicious attacks against their employees by a vindictive, unethical group who have fed discontent within the organization itself. This is a case of disgruntled union employees, past and current, engaging in malicious gossip fueled by a sense of righteousness. Because the employment industry, in case, is the media, the public has been used as a weapon in this battle, at our own expense. The CBC, the main target of these attacks, is funded by the public, and it is our tax dollars being wasted by the CBC's failure to address the actual problem. The main antagonist is a writer and podcaster credited for breaking the story on Gian Gameshi, one of the CBC's former stars. Gian Gameshi was accused of sex crimes, but was subsequently acquitted in a court of law because his accusers were found to be liars who lacked credibility. The antagonist's name is Jesse Brown, and the CBC seem to be afraid of him. This fear has cost the taxpayers a lot of money, and it has cost a number of innocent people their dignity and their careers. This will not stop until the real problem is exposed. Now, the CBC conducted a number of investigations at our expense into the Gian Gameshi scandal. The most public of these has been the Fifth Estate's The Unmaking of Gian Gameshi, <laughs> and the Janice Rubin Report, a third-party neutral investigation conducted by lawyers. Jesse Brown, self-proclaimed keeper of truth, claims to have participated with the Fifth Estate because he felt they would be seeking the truth, while he would not help with the Rubin investigation because he thought it was a whitewash, claiming the findings by this neutral party would never be published. Information released today by Chuck Thompson, CBC's head of public affairs, reveals the broadcaster's impending third-party investigation of the Gameshi scandal to be a predetermined cover-up and whitewash. Lawyer Janice Rubin's report will never be released to the public. What's more, the CBC now admits that Rubin has been contracted only to investigate past and present employees of Gameshi's shows, Q and Play. Rubin has no powers to demand answers and no mission to learn who knew what and when. Participation in the investigation seems to be entirely voluntary. Well, as it turns out, Jesse was wrong. I don't think there's any you know, corrections on that article, but the report was published, and Rubin was charged with investigating management's role as well. It was an actual neutral third-party investigation seeking the truth. On the other hand, the Fifth Estate was a publicity stunt. That's what Jesse likes, really. It was aimed at throwing at least one executive under the bus in order to save the CBC's face in the public eye. In the end, two executives were fired to appease the bloodhounds. They are now being sued by one of those two men. Let's look at the fun moment, which reveals the setup. So here we have these two dweebs, lowly employees, considered to be vulnerable staff members from the show, and they're sat on the type of chair that's normally offered to guests of the show comfortable and within the budget. Chris Boyce, an executive who was fired shortly after this, was sat on a cheap folding chair with a plastic bottle of water that he had to put on the concrete floor at his feet. My institution, your institution, the CBC. Note to CBC executives, if you find yourself walking into a CBC meeting and are offered nothing but a folding chair, no glass for your water or a table to put it on. Just tender your resignation right away. Like, don't even bother to sit down. Our story tonight is not an easy one for us to tell. Many of those you'll hear from are our colleagues. Now, the Fifth Estate may use cheap folding chairs for quick close-ups on a regular basis, but if that's what they were doing here, 
There should have been no camera setup for this wide shot. This is what's called an establishing shot in the film industry. They are establishing one thing. Chris Boyce is going to get fired. And he seems to have quickly become aware of that. Say, I can tell you that I have had conversations with a number of people, but I don't think this is the appropriate venue for us to get into a discussion of the specifics and who spoke to who. There are other slick elements used for psychological effect in the Fifth Estate program. Right off the start, Gillian Findlay says, My institution, your institution, the CBC. See, they want you to be part of their team. Get your trust and cooperation in their message. They also abused us with this ridiculous stylistic choice of wiping the screen with the image of people we're meant to trust. Jesse Brown is an independent journalist with a reputation as a provocative media critic. Journalist Anthony Azerbisius spent 20 years covering media for the Toronto Star and watched how Gameshi got made. Yeah. Matt Tunnicliffe was Q's first director. Jesse, get back here. Come on, peekaboo, don't hide. It's okay. We're going to fire someone to make you happy. We've even got your good buddy, Antonia Azerbisius, too. Remember, she's the one who helped you out. When you and your good friend Catherine Burrell set up that thing called nonfiction back in 2007, remember that? Well, actually, this is kind of important. Catherine Burrell is a central figure in the Gameshi accusations, and she and Jesse Brown were, from the very beginning of her time on Q, hosting gossip events with big-name journalists. But they wanted us to believe that they were powerless. Now, Jesse's long-term goal, as he has stated, numerous times, has always been to attack the CBC, not particularly to attack Gian Gameshi. Getting executives fired is actually his goal. He doesn't much care who he has to attack to get there, or if there's any truth involved. He's just reporting what he's managed to get people to say. Jesse's audience mostly supports his relentless assault on the CBC, and he's had some serious explaining to do, when he cooperated with the Fifth Estate in the first place. He says, I helped the CBC, or more specifically, I helped some of the CBC's last remaining investigative reporters, because they are in a unique position to find and report the truth about CBC management's role in the Gameshi case. Since parting company with the Toronto Star, which is a fun story on its own, my own investigation has focused directly on CBC management. I have learned and reported some information on this, but my access to the highest levels of the organization is very limited, and my requests for comment are met with curt denials when they are answered at all. The Fifth Estate's Jillian Findlay, her executive producer Jim Williamson, and senior producer Julian Schur promised me that they too were specifically interested in investigating CBC management. They have assured me that they have both the will and the license to hold their own bosses to account, even if it means implicating people they have personal friendships with. And they have institutional knowledge and access that I do not. So, in short, Jesse cooperated with his enemy because he had reason to expect people would get fired. So there is a big elephant in the room here that's not been dealt with either by the Fifth Estate or by the Janice Rubin report, and that was the answer to why the CBC didn't take Jesse Brown's investigation into Gian Gameshi very seriously. Our job is not to be the police. Did you ever go to Jesse Brown and ask him about these women? Would they come forward to, to talk to you? We did not. On the Fifth Estate, he claims... Had they come to you and asked you at that point about your investigation, what would you have said to them? I would have absolutely shared information. I don't think I could sleep at night being asked that question and saying, no, I've got an important news story. No, this is real. They could have picked up the phone and contacted me at any time. Yet his need to explain to his fans why he worked with the Fifth Estate makes it clear that it was surprising to people that he'd worked with anyone from the CBC at all. No one expected him to do so because he's always been antagonistic to them and to their hosts. But let's get to the allegations here. Gomeshi was accused of inappropriately sexualizing the workplace. But the CBC shows these clips on the Fifth Estate. It's good to be here. It's sexy in here. That's what we go for. 
I kind of got a little man crush on you, I have to admit. I like that you're starting this interview by flirting with me, <laughs> Jason Priestley. You'll notice here that it was guests actually flirting with Gion, and he handled it fairly appropriately. I wonder how it is that no one commented on this. Journalists didn't consider this at all. Janice Rubin didn't ask about it. But here is the reality. Celebrities have their privacy violated as part of their job. Part of Gion's job was creating a hip, fun environment where people could be themselves. Gion's sexuality was part of his job, and it was essential that people see him as sexy to attract bigger guests. That was actually part of his job. Is there anyone who doesn't understand that? You can't classify sexual innuendo and flirtiness as inappropriate workplace behavior when that was an essential element to the show, and that's actually what made it a success. That's just absurd. But staff were being sexually inappropriate towards Gian as well. They even tell us about it on the Fifth Estate. Back at the office, the rumors were dark. There was always sort of office chatter that, you know, we'd heard that he'd beat women during sex. You heard? It was just whispers, you know? It was office gossip that, you know, I heard from someone that... No one on the Fifth Estate or in the Rubin investigation asked if staff felt that it was appropriate for them to be discussing and gossiping about Gian's sexual life while they were in the workplace. In fact, when Kevin Donovan reported on how a Toronto life story was killed which planned to expose Gian's sex life, he didn't question whether or not the story was appropriate. Instead, Donovan implies that Gian's attempt to maintain some privacy was some sort of character flaw on his part. Donovan must think that celebrities owe the public their private life details. In assessing Gian Gameshi's sexual persona, no one pays any attention to the inappropriateness of the public sexualizing Gian Gameshi. This is the price that he had to pay, as other celebrities do, in exchange for fame. Fame does not come easy. Well, I'm not going to argue poor little rich boy here, but we must admit, the public sexualized him, his sexuality was part of his job, and you can't call him a creep for doing his fucking job. I kind of got a little man crush on you, I have to admit. I like that you're starting this interview by flirting with me, <laughs> Jason Priestley. There seems to have been no investigation either into whether or not producers on the show joked around sexually with each other, aside from Gian. Was that part of the overall environment on this hot, new, sexy, exciting show? Well, no one cared to ask. If that's the way it was, what would it have been like in a casual, fun workplace that Gian had himself created to be treated like a pariah on your own show? Remember, Gian Gameshi was not what union employees at the CBC call the corpse. He belonged to the same union they did. He was not as they say, the brass. These phrases, the corpse and the brass, are regularly employed by Canadian Media Guild union members to describe their employer. The corpse and the brass are very telling. There's an animosity towards the CBC by a sector of their own employees, and the CBC have not dealt with that. Malicious gossip has recently been identified as a serious problem in workplaces. Human resources departments have started taking it very seriously, and they should. I worked in an environment that had a similar gossip problem to what is obviously going on at the CBC, and they brought in an outside firm that was hired to come in and investigate the issue and make recommendations. That was a business much smaller than the CBC, with only a fraction of their budget. Yet the CBC has spent all their resources empowering the gossip queens and letting them run the show. I would love to have seen the Fifth Estate asking Q employees why they thought gossiping about Gian's sex life was okay. But when he actually told them about problems in his sex life, it was a violation and inappropriate behavior. 
He'd been moodier than usual, according to producers, but it wasn't until the team traveled to Winnipeg for a live show that a couple of them would learn why. Gian asked us to both stop working and essentially broke down. I've called this video the unmaking of the CBC. And I'm not trying to unmake them. I'm trying to outline how they have been allowing themselves to be unmade by their enemies, their known enemies. What we've got here is a small group stirring discontent within the CBC, generating and feeding malicious gossip circles, targeting all the hosts for public shaming, and picking them off one by one until they can get an executive fired. Then reset, start over. This is an assault on a publicly funded institution, and it's costing the taxpayers a lot of money for these ridiculous self-investigations and safe space projects when what they should be doing is dealing with the gossip problem. If a private business had employees actively working to undermine them, they would deal with that problem. Why hasn't the CBC? As Jillian pointed out, My institution. Your institution. The CBC. And to some degree, it is my CBC. I pay my taxes. And as a financial backer of the CBC, I demand that they run it like a business and protect my investment. How bad is the gossip problem at the CBC? Well, in Kevin Donovan's article about the quashed Toronto life story, which was in and of itself an entirely inappropriate story only worthy of sites like Gawker or Canada Land, he tells us that Catherine Burrell, <laughs> co figure it's her, told the journalist working on the story back in 2013, three years after she'd quit the show and moved to another country, she says, just so you know, Gian Gameshi is quite odious to date. Now, Burrell was still spreading malicious gossip three years later, three years after she'd left the show. Catherine Burrell never dated Gian Gameshi, nor did she personally know any of his girlfriends. So thanks, Kevin Donovan, for publishing malicious gossip in the Toronto Star. Now back to the CBC. They show us bits of the email that Jesse Brown sent to the CBC employees when trying to elicit more accusations. It was obviously worded in such a way that he was telling people what allegations he was looking for. And so in late June, Brown had an email delivered to a few Q employees. He laid out the story that he and the star had been working on. Not only that a series of women had now come forward alleging non-consensual behavior, he used the word assault and had information, he said, that inappropriate behavior may have crossed over into the workplace. Regardless of this poor technique, he didn't actually manage to solicit any. Only Jesse's good friend, Catherine Burrell, was on his roster of accusers by the time they published. This is very telling. In a court case, Robinson v. Furlong, the judge agreed with evidence from a psychologist that this type of appeal by a journalist, where you tell people what you want them to remember, will contribute to tainted memories. Incidentally, Brown later interviewed Laura Robinson, who was found guilty of doing this, on his show, Canada Land, and he showed support for her methods, her flawed methods. The Fifth Estate should have asked Jesse Brown if his messages to ex-girlfriends were similar in poor quality. They should have asked if he'd announced what type of memories he was looking for. There was zero analysis of Brown's technique and whether or not he tainted his sources from the very beginning by telling them what he wanted them to say. In Janice Rubin's report, she does ask why CBC management didn't approach Jesse Brown to ask him to share information with them. Though large portions are redacted from this section of the report, there's no evidence that the CBC actually addressed their concerns with Jesse Brown's integrity as a journalist. Jesse Brown was a known, malicious gossip monger with an agenda of harming the CBC and its hosts, and they knew that. Our duty as an employer, first and foremost, is to protect our employees in the workplace. Jillian, if somebody sent me information about you, I, I would hope that, you know, you would expect for me to deal with it responsibly. The Fifth Estate ends with a call for information that will help the CBC investigate harassment in the workplace. 
The CBC has ordered a top-to-bottom investigation encouraging anyone with information about abuse or harassment to come forward. And I'm going to answer that call. In 2005, a site called The Tea Makers was created because of a lockout in the CBC workplace. This site quickly morphed into a free-for-all bullying of CBC hosts like Gian Gameshi and George Strombolopoulos and many other employees of the CBC. This bullying went on for many years, and CBC management was aware of it. They chose to not do anything about it, and they specifically informed the creator of the site that they would not do anything about it. The tea makers posted items that sexually mocked and harassed Gian Gameshi, mocked him racially and professionally, sought to humiliate him and denigrate him in every way. Though it's unlikely to be true, the writers of the Tea Maker site were convinced that Gian was reading their site, even accusing some people who criticized them there of being Gian Gameshi himself. And this is important in terms of how visible they felt their harassment to be, and how effective they felt their harassment was. In terms of workplace bullying and harassment, you can't get any more severe than what was going on at the Tea Makers, and the CBC management knew about it, but announced that they would do nothing to stop it. Jesse Brown also knew about the site, but he called it speaking truth to power. Jesse's complaint to the tea makers. It's about random character assassination. You may as well just pick a stranger off the street and start debating whether they deserve the money in their wallet or the clothes on their back. That you're doing so anonymously is a factor. Anonymity may be necessary when telling truth to power, when criticizing your employer or your government, but why is it needed to rip on someone like Burrell? Yes, he's there defending, as we've continually said, his good friend Catherine Burrell, who was also not liked at the CBC. About anonymity, Jesse Brown says, the only reason I can think of is that you're ashamed of what you're saying. See, Jesse Brown had no problem with the public humiliation and bullying of Gian Gameshi. The only problem he had, and this is ironic as hell, was that they were doing it anonymously. Take a moment to laugh your ass off right now. Every story that Jesse Brown breaks involves anonymous sources. In fact, it's so bad and so obvious that he's now substituting the word confidential for anonymous. And that is what makes Jesse so toxic. Jesse Brown has no moral compass. And for those of you who still think that Burrell was actually assaulted in the workplace, this mostly redacted section of the Janice Rubin report, finding a witness to lack credibility, the only one whose credibility she questions, well, it's fairly obvious she's talking about Burrell's supposed witness, Roberto Verri. From the Rubin report regarding a person who refused to cooperate with them, we provided an alternative proposal to, hmm, probably Roberto Verri, which we believed fairly addressed these probably sexual assault concerns. This proposal was rejected by the former Chase producer, and instead the prospective witness provided us with a written statement as an alternative to an interview. Later on in this process, blank, 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 we made a second attempt to interview this person as we believe that a face-to-face -face meeting was a more effective and fair way to deal with what was in part an issue of credibility. This request was also denied. From Canada Land, telling us why Roberto Verri wouldn't participate in the Janus Rubin investigation, Roberto Verri has provided a copy of his reply to Janice Rubin's request to Canada Land, and it reads as follows. Ms. Rubin, I'm going to decline. Given the parameters of your investigation, I doubt anything will change at the corpse. I asked around and talked to others you spoke to, and while they thought you were great, they also thought that there was no chance that the internal investigation could incite, incite any sort of positive change and specifically help young women who work there. The brass have already picked out people to let slowly twist in the wind, ducked and covered and gone into spin. 
and not for nothing, but I also feel like talking to you is pro bono troubleshooting consulting. I'll wait for the Crown Inquiry to speak up. Good luck. So I think it's pretty obvious that Roberto Verri was the single person that Janice Rubin really doubted credibility of. And I'd say that she had good reason to do so. If even Janice Rubin recognized Roberto Verri lacked credibility, what would Marie Hennen have shown us in court? You know, I kind of feel ripped off. <laughs>